So today we want to continue talking about vector spaces. And so let's just remind ourselves where we left off. We were thinking about how we had talked about vectors in our first linear algebra course, introduction linear algebra. And there we had typically worked in some Rn. For example, we might think of working in R3. And, and we had vectors as just some objects in here. So, so here's one vector. This would be the vector, say, um, 1, 0, 0, if we think about this as being your x-axis, your y-axis, and your z-axis. And, and then maybe we have some other vector like this guy, which we can conceive of as 0, 0, 1. And, and once you have these vectors, last time we talked about the kinds of things you can do with these vectors, right? We said you can add them together, you can scale them, you can, um, when you add them, that addition is commutative, when you add them, it's associative, uh, when you scale the distributive properties that play well with the addition, we listed all those properties. And then we said, okay, what we're gonna do from now on is instead of limiting our attention to just R3, we're gonna say a vector space is any collection of objects, vectors, and scalars that satisfy those kinds of properties, right? So, so we had introduced the idea of a vector space. And, and we went through and we gave lots of examples. So what were some of the vector spaces we talked about? Polynomials, great. So here I, um, we can just use the notation big P. If you want to talk about all polynomials, big P. If you want to limit yourself to say polynomials of degree at most two, maybe something like P2. But polynomials satisfy these properties. You can add two polynomials together, get another polynomial. You can scale a polynomial by some scalar, um, say multiply the polynomial by three, and it's still a polynomial. What's another one? Matrices, yeah. So, so I had introduced this notation, um, fancy M, and, and we can say sub M N, this would be M by N matrices. We shouldn't talk about the collection of all matrices, why not? They won't add together. If I have like a two by three matrix and a four by five matrix, I can't add them together. In a vector space, I want to be able to add my things together. So I'm going to limit myself to say matrices of dimension M by N, and then you can specify where the entries are coming from, say matrices with real values that are M by N, and you can look at that entire collection. Yeah. Okay, what some other things? Yeah, so, so you have these polynomials, but that is a, a subset of a larger collection uh, called f will do, so just for function, where these are real valued functions. So any function that eats in a real value and spits out a real value, like sine of x, right? e to the x, whatever, whichever one you might think of. And, and last class, we said a couple things that, that not only is p squared a subset of f, but since P squared, P2, is, is itself a vector space. We call B2 a subspace of, of the vector space F. So if a subset is a vector space in its own right, we call it a subspace. Okay, so this is reminding us, not only are we thinking about vectors as objects in R3 or Rn, but we're thinking about polynomials, we're thinking about matrices, we're thinking about other kinds of objects. And so what we want to do now is we want to um, go back over linear algebra from the ground we tried before, talk about some things we can do with these vectors and see how well does it generalize to other kinds of vector spaces. And so once you introduce vectors and you introduce this idea of adding them and scaling them, one of the first ideas you often see in linear algebra is the idea of, of a linear combination of these vectors. So, so if I call this vector, for example, v1, and I call this vector v2, what do I mean by a linear combination of v1 and v2? Well, it's just anything that I get by putting together copies of v1 and copies of v2, right? So, so some linear combination of v1 and v2. Well, I don't know, like, let, let me give an example. Uh, how about the vector, ah, th this one I wrote incorrectly. It's pointed like this, so it's really the vector 0, 1, 1, yeah? So, so how about the vector, say, W, 
which I'll just define to be uh, three, negative two, negative two. Is that a linear combination of V1 and V2? Yeah, how do we get it? Well, it's just gonna be three copies of V1 plus, well, negative two copies, so minus two copies of V2, right? So some vectors are linear combinations of vectors. However, if I think about a vector like, oh, let's call it uh, x, I hate this notation. What, oh, this is really bad notation. Let's we'll just call it z. If we think about the vector 0, 0, 1, is this a linear combination of v1 and v2? Okay, I mean, combine copies of v1 and v2 to get z. It's like, well, I don't think so. It's like, I, I want to just get that one by itself. Here I have two ones. How can I get rid of that one? This one's not going to help do that in any way, right? So it doesn't seem like it. But how do we verify this? The way we did this back in linear algebra is you would say, okay, well, let's try and write 0, 0, 1 as some number of copies of your first guy, 1, 0, 0, plus some number of copies of your second guy, 0, 0, uh, 0 1, 1. Some number of copies of that second guy. And then we ask, is there any solution to this? Here, our C1s and C2s are inside of R. Our ground field, our, our, our field of scalars is R. So we're asking, are there any real solutions to this? Well, we can simplify this. We can say this is C1 times 1. So this is just C1, 0, 0, plus C2 scales this. So it's 0, C2, C2. So that gives you C1, C2, C2. And then what does it mean for two vectors to be equal to each other? It means each of their components are the same. But what's the problem here? Well, here I'm insisting that my C2 is 1. But I also have that C2 is 0. A contradiction, right? So since we resulted in this contradiction, there must be no solution to this. Hence, z is not a linear combination of v1 and v2. Is this familiar? You remember doing this back in, back in your first course in linear algebra? OK, let's go ahead and get a definition. So we want to generalize this idea of linear combination. And so we're going to say a linear combination of some collection of vectors which belong to some vector space is just given by some multiple of the first vector plus some multiple of the second vector down through some multiple of the last vector, where these ci values are scalars over whatever your ground field is. We should note that this linear combination of these guys is itself an element of the vector field. Why? Well, vector fields are closed under scaling. So since v1 is in there, c1 times v1 is an element of the vector field. And since v2 is in there, c2 times v2 is an element of the vector field. All the way down through ck times vk is an element of the vector field. And we say that vector fields are closed under addition. Therefore, a sum of elements of the vector field will itself be an element of the vector field. Exactly analogous to how if you add vectors and scale and add them in R3, you end up with something still in R3. So when you take a linear combination, you're still inside your vector field.
That just follows directly from a definition of vector fields being closed. Okay, so we have some notion of linear combination, but, but now let's look at an example that doesn't involve, say, examples in R3, but let's do something with, I don't know, polynomials. Let me give you two vectors. Let me call them V1 and V2, which would be elements of P2. Let's just make two up. Uh, x squared plus x plus one, and I don't know, x squared minus three. So here are two elements that are both living inside of P2. So then what we can do is we can pick some other element of P2, and we can ask, for example, uh, is W, uh, give me your favorite quadratic. x squared, okay. Is x squared a linear combination of v1 and v2? Okay, I haven't specified it, but I'm assuming here my scalars are coming from the reals, right? So these are polynomials with real coefficients and I'm scaling by real numbers. Okay, so how could we possibly solve this? How, can we build x squared from these other two polynomials by scaling and adding? Well, you kind of look at it and you're like, I want to get this x squared piece by itself. Can I get the x squared piece by itself? Well, I have to either get rid of this minus three or this x plus one. Is there some way to combine these that, that will get rid of those pieces? Doesn't really look like it. You can add them or subtract them, but don't really get an x squared by itself, but we want to be sure. So let's do the exact same thing we did before. Let's just ask, is there any possible solution of scaling one plus scaling another to get the guy we want? We want to try and solve. Is there any solution to x squared equals some scalar multiple of the first vector, x squared plus x plus one, plus some scalar multiple of the second vector, x squared minus three. Well, we can rearrange this. Here I have c1 x squareds and c2 x squareds. So I have C1 plus C2 x squareds, plus I have C1 copies of x and no copies of x, so plus C1 copies of x. Here I have C1 copies of one and negative three copies of C2, so I have C1 minus three C2. And then we remember two polynomials are equal if all the coefficients are the same. Here my coefficient of x squared is one. So this is claiming that c1 plus c2, the coefficient of x squared, must be one. But c1 is also a coefficient of x. Here there is no x, so the coefficient of x must be zero. Hence c1 must be zero. And your constant is c1 minus three c2, but there is no constant, so c1 minus three c2 must also be zero. Is there a solution to the set of equations? Well, if c1 is zero and c1 plus c2 is one, together that gives you that c2 is zero. But if c2 is zero, you plug this in here and you get, oh, this seems fine. Ah, oh, sorry, c2 must be one, ah. C2 must be one, so you plug this in here and I get zero minus three is zero. I get negative three equals zero, a contradiction, so there's no solution. Exactly the same thing we do with vectors. I mean, you can almost even think of this as just be like an R3, right? It's like, 
Whatever the coefficient of the x squared is, that's the first component of your vector. Whatever the coefficient of x is, that's the second component. Whatever the coefficient of 1 is, that's your third. So it's a very easy way to translate this in your mind, just thinking about vectors in R3, although here we're thinking about quadratic, right? That is, you can in your mind imagine this just being like the vector 1, 0, 0, the x squared coefficient, the x coefficient, the constant coefficient, and you're asking if you can make that as a linear combination of 1, 1, 1, and uh, 1, 0, minus 3. So in this particular case, it's very easy to just translate it mentally to what you've done before. Okay. So, so he is not inside of there. Let's go back to this example. Here we have two vectors. We can make linear combinations of them. Geometrically, if we consider the set of all linear combinations, what would that look like? All linear combinations of v1 and v2, what would that look like? Yeah, it would be all the vectors contained in this slanted plane right here, right? And what do we call that plane? Well, it's a set of all linear combinations. That plane is just the span, remember this language? It's the plane spanned by the vectors v1 and v2. Some things are inside of it. You can build some other vectors like this guy by a linear combination of them, but some things are not. For example, our vector up here of 0, 0, 1 is not inside this plane. This vector right here is not inside the plane, right? So in linear algebra, you this is an idea of a span of two vectors. Let's do the exact same thing. So if B is some subset of your vector space, then we're going to define the span of B to be just the collection of all linear combinations of vectors in B. So the collection of all C1, V1, up through CK, VK, where your V1 through your VK live inside of your vector space, and your C1 through your CK live in whatever your ground field is. Typically for us, it's just the real numbers, Sometimes maybe the complex, but whatever that field might be. Okay. So if we come back to this problem, what we are really saying here is we were just saying that this x squared is not an element of the span of this v1 and this v2. It's not a linear combination of them, so it doesn't live in the span, right? It's all we are saying. Now, this seems really familiar, but there's one word of warning I want to give you. This b, for us, could be an infinite collection. For example, if we consider the entire set of polynomials, all of them of all powers, that forms a vector space. You add two polynomials, you get a polynomial, you can scale by polynomials, there's a zero polynomial, it satisfies all the properties from last lecture. And so we can consider a subset which consists of one x x squared, x cubed, and so on. All the powers of x, where one is just x to the zero. This is a subset of P. And I'll call it B. Okay, what kinds of things live inside of here? What is inside of the span of B? 
You could do an x plus one. You could do a two x plus one. You could do a seven x cubed plus two x minus 14, right? You can get whatever polynomial you want. You can get any polynomial. This, this, inside the span of B, you get all of P. So, so the span of B recovers all of your polynomials. And so we're going to say that the, the, the vector space of polynomials, P, is spanned by B. Right? It's spanned by B. But here's something that, well, how about this guy? One plus x plus one half x squared plus one over six, which is three factorial. This one half is just two factorial, x cubed plus one over four factorial x to the fourth, and keep going forever. What is that? You remember from what calculus two, do you see this? This is just e to the x. Is e to the x inside the span of b? Is he in there? No. This is an infinite sum, and it's really important when we have these sums, we remember we're only going to allow finite linear combinations. Finite linear combinations. A finite sum. This is why I said one through k, where k is some integer value, right? Some, some non-negative, some positive integer value. And so we do not allow infinite linear combinations inside the span. The span is defined to be the collection of finite linear combinations of vectors inside of v, B. Even though there are infinitely many vectors inside of here, for any particular element of the span, you're only using finitely many of them. So e to the x is not inside the span, but any other polynomial you, you want is, because any polynomial you pick has only finitely many powers of x. Are we happy with that? Yeah. For, oh, absolutely. This is a bad typo. Your span is linear combinations of elements of whatever your subset is. Yeah, good catch, good catch. Okay, good. Okay, what's the next notion you talk about when you did linear algebra? You've talked about uh, linear combinations and, and, and spans. What's the next thing you talk about? Linear. Yeah, linear independence, linear dependence, right? But, but now we're in a little bit of a pickle because you know, I wanna ask a question like this one. Um, are the vectors one, x, x squared, forever, is this collection of vectors linearly independent? And, and the way you probably saw this before is what it means to be linear com independent is there's no linear combination of these that gives you zero, right? But you don't want to do it as an infinite sum. We, we don't want to ask, what we, we're not asking, we're not asking, is there some combination C1, C2x, uh, well, let's call it C0 for, agreement with the powers, c to x squared, some infinite sum that equals zero. We want to avoid this. Instead, we want to be asking, instead, we're asking, does there exist a finite sum? Does there exist some finite sum of c0, c1x, 
Well, for some subset, some finite collection of these guys, right? So, so maybe x isn't included in that finite collection. We can add it. But the point is we want to stop at some finite value. We allow it to be any finite value. k can be as big as you want. A huge number like 42 or whatever, or 500, or a quadrillion, or whatever you want. But we're asking, is there any solution to this for non-trivial C1 through CK? Where by non-trivial, recall I just mean not all zero. That's what we're asking. If we go back to this example right here, are these three vectors linearly independent? Well, you can't build the x squared out of these other two. That's what we saw. But you still might wonder, like, well, is v2 secretly a multiple of v1? And you can check that's not the case. But really, this is the same as just asking, well, is there any combination of these three that together give you zero without all the coefficients just being zero? Right? Is it, is it clear why that's equivalent? If, if there was some solution like this, where these are not all zero, then you could solve for one in terms of the other, right? You could, like, you know, maybe there's some solution to this where your C2 is some non-zero value. Then you can isolate this on one side, divide by C2, and then you have x squared in terms of the other ones. And so in that sense, x squared would be redundant. We wouldn't need x squared. The picture you should have in your mind from linear algebra is you have some, you have some collection of vectors. I don't know, maybe there's like a vector here. Well, let's stick with the same thing from last time. A vector here and a vector here. Together they span some plane. And, and the question is, well, did you add any extra vectors? If I also included this vector, well, now these are linearly independent because this is redundant. I could build this vector out of the other ones. So he's not needed. Okay, so let's make this definition precise and then we can try and answer this question. So, so my definition for linearly independent is just going to be, Um, we're going to call, um, we say B is linearly dependent if there exists some collection of vectors V1 through VK inside of B. such that scalar multiples of v1 through vk added together, that is some linear combination of v1 through vk, results in the zero vector for a non-trivial that is not all zero, some of them can be zero but not all, for some non-trivial c1 through ck scalars. Else, we would say B is linearly independent. So here's my question, why can't this happen? Why isn't there some sum of C0 through CK some, some scale of C0 through CK, such that this linear combination gives you zero. Why can't we build X squared out of the other powers of X? I mean, like, how do we know X squared isn't secretly some, or even like, how do we know X to the fifth isn't equal to the same as some quadratic function. Yeah. 
Have you ever thought about this before? Well, let's do it now. We want to show that there's no solution to C1, uh, uh, C0 plus C1x plus C2x squared up through some power, just a finite sum, up to some CK xk. We want to show that there's no solution to this where our C1 through our CK are real numbers. So suppose there was. You found some special values of C. Three, eight, whatever your special values are. Well, what can we say? Here we have some polynomial. This, this is just some polynomial we have here. Let me call that polynomial P of X. Okay? P of X is a zero polynomial. Which means whatever you plug in, it has to equal zero. Right? Whatever you plug into P of X, it's going to equal zero. But what happens if I plug zero in? Well, it has to equal zero. But what does the polynomial reduce down to? Just C1, yeah? If I plug in zero, all of these vanish except for the first coefficient, the constant term. And hence, your constant term must itself be zero. Great. Now we want some way of arguing that not only is C zero zero, but actually all of them have to be zero. Because if we can show that, then we know there's no non-trivial solution. The only solution is the trivial one where these are all zero. So what's an argument I can do to show that C1 must also be zero? Take the derivative, right? What is your derivative? Well, P prime of X, the derivative is just the C0 vanishes. Then you have C1 plus two C2X all the way through K C K X to the K minus one. And, and since the original function was a constantly zero, its derivative is also zero, yeah? But then I get that when I plug in zero to it, it must be zero, but when I plug in zero, I just get C1 is zero. And then I can take the derivative again, and now I'll be left with my first term being just two C2, but taking that second derivative, so now I just have two C2 plus uh, you know, keep going until this last term is now like a k times k minus one times ck to the x to the k minus two. Well, that must still be zero. So when I plug zero into the second derivative, it must be zero, but plugging zero into this just recovers the constant term, which is now two c2. Hence, c2 must also be zero. And you continue, you do it for k derivatives, and you conclude that your c1, your c2, all of them must be zero. Hence, the only solution to this is the trivial solution. Thus, it's a linearly independent set. Thus, one, x, x squared, and so forth, is linearly independent. Yeah? If I had a set of two linearly dependent vectors and then, a, and then one that's independent from them, would the whole set be linearly independent? No, if you have um, any vectors that are redundant, the whole thing's uh, uh, linearly dependent, right? So, so your question is, if I have something like, oh, what? You want to know if I have a collection like 2x, x, 
and x plus 1, do we call that linearly independent or linearly dependent? Is that the question? OK. And you're like, well, this guy seems redundant because you can get him by just scaling this other guy. But how does that translate into our definition? Well, let's think. Are there any coefficients we can find to put in front of this collection of vectors, polynomials, that will help us sum it to 0, some non-zero coefficients? What, what might our coefficients be? Some of them can be 0, but they can't all be 0. So like, what would our coefficients be? Is there a set where not all the coefficients are 0? That make it come up, add up to 0? 1, negative 2. And this one you can make 0. That's fine. You can make that coefficient 0. But now it sums to 0. So if some sub-collection is linearly dependent, then the whole thing is linearly dependent. OK. I, I should just note that you know, sometimes this, this problem of trying to determine when some collection is linearly independent or dependent is quite tricky. You know, like, like how about this one? Sine of x, cosine of x, and sine squared of x. This is some, some subset, some b inside of the vector space of continuous, uh, uh, of, of just real value functions. It's actually continuous functions, but let's just say it's, it belongs to a set of real valued functions. Let's say our scalars are coming from the real numbers. Are these linearly independent or linearly dependent? I don't know. I mean, is there any solution to some number of copies of sine of x plus some number of copies of cosine of x plus some number of copies of sine squared of x is 0? Is there any solution to this? Besides the trivial solution, we just put in 0 for all the coefficients. Well, you might think back to trig identities and like, is there any trig identity where I can build one of these from the other two? by just multiplying and adding or subtracting. And so you can go try and remember some of that. Well, when you get down to something like this, I encourage you to try the trick we just did. Plug in some particular values of x. So what's one nice value of x we might try and plug in? Let's plug in a value like, great, x equals 0. Since this is true for all x, it must be true for x equals 0. At 0, sine is 0, cosine is 1. So this term vanishes. This is 1, so you just have c of 2. This guy vanishes. So plugging in x equals 0 just gives you that c2 must be 0. OK? What else might we plug in? Pi over 2, great. Let's plug in pi over 2. Let's see what we get now. Now at pi over 2, the top of your unit circle, sine is 1. So you have a c1 that remains here. c2, well, well cosine becomes 0 at pi over 2, so this, this vanishes. And, and here, you still have a, a 1, and then you have um, 1 times c3, uh, c3, so it's c3 is 0. OK, here's two expressions. I don't see any contradictions yet. Anything else we should plug in? Which one? 3 pi over 2, down here. Excellent. Let's plug in the bottom of the unit circle, 3 pi over 2, because what that will do is it makes sine negative 1. Cosine is still 0, this term vanishes, but sine is negative 1, so we get a negative c1. And here, Sine is negative 1, but that makes sine squared positive 1, so we still have plus c3. And then we just look at these last two expressions. If both of these are 0, then the sum of them must be 0. Summing them together, together gives you 2c3 is 0, hence c3 is 0. But once you know c3 is 0, you can plug that into this expression, 
And that gives you that C1 is zero. Hence, you have C1, C2, and C3 are all zero. So the only solution to this is the trivial solution. Hence, indeed, this collection is linearly independent. Good. But you know, be careful, because sometimes it might look like it's only independent, but maybe there's some trig function that relates them, right? In this case, there isn't, but there maybe there's some trig identities you need to be on the lookout for. OK. Um, the last thing I want to do is prove a low theorem. In R3, when you looked at the span of these two vectors, it gave you a plane. A plane is a vector space in itself, right? Take any two vectors in there, you add them, get another one. This is the theorem I want to prove. In general, if you take any B, that's a subset of some vector space. The span of B will also be a vector space. That is, the span of B will be a subspace of the vector space V. So let's think how we prove this. How do we show that a subset is in fact a subspace, that it is a vector space in its own right? End of last lecture, we said there are two things we need to check. We don't need to check that the elements inside of span of B are um, associative and additive and all those things. We just get that from the fact that span of B is itself a subset of V. So since the stuff inside of V is commutative and associative, that's still going to happen in the subset. But how do we know it's actually a, a subspace? That is, it's a vector space in its own right. We check two things. Yep, closure under addition and closure under scalar multiplication. That is, we want to show that two things. If, say, V1, and, well, let's call them V and W. V and W are both elements of the span of B, then here's what we need to show. We're showing this. Then we want to show that V plus W is also an element of the span of B. That's closure under addition. And we want to show that any multiple of V is an element in the span of B as well. Then we'll have that it's both closure under addition and scalar multiplication. But now that we know what to do, it's not so bad. Because if we're given V and W inside of the span of B, we just think back to the definition, what this means. It means that both V and W can be written as linear combinations of elements of B. V is some C1, V1 through Cj, Vj. And W is some D1, W1 through DK, WK, where your VIs and your WIs are elements of B. I can write V as some linear combination of stuff in, inside of B, and I can write W as some linear combination of stuff inside of B. I gave it these names just to be able to easily keep track of it. But then it immediately follows that V plus W is just going to be, well, just C1, V1 through Cj, Vj plus D1, W1 through Dk, Wk. That is, it's just a linear combination of these Vs and these Ws, these Vis and these Wis, which are elements of B. Hence, this itself is an element of the span of B.
and c times v is just c times all this. So it's c times this whole thing. But by one of our properties of vector spaces, we can write that as c times c1 of v1 through c times cj of vj. And all of these guys are just new scalars. And so it's still just a linear combination of elements of B. So this is also inside the span of B. So just like picking two vectors in R3 spans a plane, which is a subspace of three-dimensional space, picking whatever collection of vectors you want inside of V, even an infinite collection if you like, taking their span gives you a new vector space, some subspace. Okay, we'll pick up next time by talking about the idea of basis and dimension.